crawl, walk, run worked great for us before I got a single dollar uh, or requested a single dollar of someone to invest in us because we were bootstrapped to that point. I wanted some level of market validation. Welcome back to another episode of the Revenue Reimagined podcast. We are stoked to have with us today Dave Kennett, who is the founder and CEO of RealPlays IQ, which is a sales call intelligence solution for software sales teams. Dave is a seasoned software executive and GTM advisor who is super passionate about helping sales teams reach their full potential and has a diverse career experience ranging from leading sales teams and scaling revenue growth in early to late stage startups to also holding senior positions in much larger companies such as WW Granger and Auto Trader. So everything from really early level, your own company now, to the biggest of the big. Dave, thanks for joining, man. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Thanks for joining, Dave. Appreciate it. So what, one of the things we like to talk to most of the founders about when we start off, and I think this is a, a lost art, is really the origin story of Replays, where it came from, why you were so passionate about building this company. Yeah, that one is just an easy answer. And it's like, there's an itch that I had that needed to be scratched. I'm like, I wonder if this is an issue for others. And being a you know, being in tech for a long time, being in sales, you know, my whole career and a sales leader in tech for a long time. It's one of those things where I happen to be very passionate about sales process, and sales coaching. And there was definitely dissonance in terms of what I believed should happen in a world-class uh, sales organization and what was happening in the sales organizations I was leading. I was not getting an A plus for it. If you were to come in, if Revenue Reimagine were to come in and say, all right, let's see how Kenneth's doing here. You might give me, you know, some good marks here, there, but you'd, you'd probably say, ah, you're, you're, you're not crushing it on the sales coaching side. And uh, I had to obviously do some self-reflection on why that was. Uh, we were getting feedback from reps saying we, you know, our man, my manager's not giving me enough coaching. And um, I, I would ask the team like, what, what, you know, what's blocking that? And it, we all know what's blocking that. We've all lived it. We see it every day. It's just the hustle bustle of a frontline sales manager. I believe it's like the most sandwiched role in the organization, right? right? It's like they have such a responsibility and duty of care with their team to support them, but then also managing up and making sure they're getting the right amount of information up. They just don't have time to review calls. And so um, you look at the major platforms out there that are conversational intelligence tools they were doing a great job at telling you what happened sure. in a sales call, but they don't tell you if your sales rep did a good job. And that's the reason you're actually reviewing calls. So um, I thought, okay, is there a need out there? So I reached out to a couple of, you know, CEO friends of mine, uh, people like the Jason Smith at Clue. And I'm like, and they, it was early days for them back then. Uh, Clue has become such an amazing success story now in the competitive intelligence space in the SaaS world. And I think they only had like four reps and, uh, and I think a few of those reps are now there still as senior management and they just didn't have time to review calls. So uh, I would jump in to their gong instance and review calls for them and they got good results. And then I did that for a few other co companies. They got good results. I ratcheted up the price. They still paid it. Um, <laughs> and then it got to renewal time. They'd still renew. It got to the point where I was just too busy to do that day to day um, and or do that on evenings and weekends and do my day job. So I jumped into it full time. Then my days were too busy. And fast forward, you know, to about a year and a half ago. So we'd done that. We're five years in at Replays. Uh, three and a half years, we were a coaching business. The last year and a half, we've been building Replays IQ, which is the AI version of call reviews. So we got three and a half years into the uh, human side of it. And we had 24, you know, amazing, amazing coaches reviewing sales calls for top tier software organizations from outreach to Vidyard right up to IBM. And, uh, and so that's the why it is like, Hey, every single sales rep out there deserves to get the right amount of attention and support in the form of call reviews and role plays. But, and I think sales leaders are very well intentioned and want to do it. Some just don't have time. Some don't have the background and framework to do it. So that's what we set out to solve. And then we're like, so that's the, the services business. And then the replays IQ, it's just like every single time we were getting on a QBR with our sales leadership teams of our customers, they tell us what they loved and hated about their tech stack. And they're like, we thought our call recording tool was going to make it so that we do less call reviews, but it really doesn't. 
streamlines your time a little bit. Uh, so we said, let's go build it. And we did. So now we have a uh, Replays IQ is a sales AI generated uh, co-pilot that reviews your sales calls and gives you coaching better than the 24 humans that we actually uh, had, <laughs> including myself. Yeah, we, I replaced myself with, um, you know, with, with, with this AI tool. So it's super interesting to me because having been a frontline leader <clears throat> doing those call reviews, having been a senior level leader chasing my frontline leaders to do those call reviews, yeah. um, having had reps come to me asking, you know, why can't I get any coaching, um, like real coaching, th this definitely, you know, rings home. I used to be the biggest gong fanboy in the world. Um, like if you were to go back like years ago and looked at my LinkedIn, like I think I was always like preaching the power of gong. But I think you said something that's very true. Like gong could certainly, you know, do a great job of, oh, you know, you spoke this much or this is what happened on the call. But like it, it's not coaching you to get better. Yeah. Um, certainly not if it, the way 98 and a half percent of people are using it. Yeah. So in my pre-show prep, like I checked out your website and you have two people whom I respect a ton, both Mark Cosblow and Kyle Norton, like are highlighted on, on the front of your, your website. Um, two of the smartest revenue leaders I know, which tells me that you guys are doing something right. When you look at coaching reps and call coaching, we talked about the origin story, but like what makes good call coaching? Because I think call coaching is broken, right? So as you've built this AI and as you continue to refine the AI, what is good call coaching? What do mm -hmm. I as a rep, because you just said it's better than the 24 people who are doing it. What makes it better? Why is, why is it better and why is it so important that it is better? Yeah. Uh, so I think there's a couple things to unpack there. I mean, if we just unpack the second question, which is, okay, why replays IQ uh, can score at, you know, we have a team of PhDs and they use mean absolute error as the key indicator. So uh, uh, they have spreadsheet after spreadsheet of humans versus replays IQ and the best humans. And our MAE is, uh, just to bore the audience a little bit here, uh, the MAE, zero is perfect, okay? So if you sure. had a perfect human, perfect <clears throat> robot scoring call, it would be zero. And uh, the average replays IQ MAE is 0.5 to 0.8. And the average, if the three of us were to review a call, would be 2.3 to 2.8. So um, we're basically, replays IQ is three to five times better than a human. Why is that? Well, we... Um, you know, I, I, we might sit there and review a call for 45 minutes and we get a Slack notification or we think we're hungry and start thinking about dinner um, or we start thinking about that conversation we had with someone last night. And that's just the reality. AI doesn't do that. Uh, AI hallucinates a lot. AI has all yep. sorts of problems. But when you've got the right context of data that you've actually labeled and, um, and built the model for, then it gets very consistent. Then it's like the analogy uh, 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 Kalen from our team uses, he's uh, head of data insights and he's just, he's just awesome. And he says he used to be a wrestler. And uh, so not only does R AI... wrestler to head of data insights. <laughs> yeah. I like we, it. All right. We, I'm in. We, we plucked him right out of WWF. No, he, <laughs> he, back in the day, I, I'm guessing that was a high school sports thing. I don't know, but you know, he said, it's a weird thing about me, Dave. I can, look at a, at a guy and I can know his weight within 10 pounds uh, all the time, uh, maybe even five pounds. But he goes, you get on a scale, you know what it is exactly. And replays IQ is like that scale, right? Mm. It just, it's, you just, it's right. And so it's amazing how many times we thought replays IQ was wrong when we were doing our initial models and we were wanting to get it to a point that we can put it in production. And we're like, oh my gosh, we thought it was wrong on this uncovering second level pain. Like, no, I'd rank the sales rep uh, a four and replays IQ out of four and replays IQ had ranked it a two. It's like, Oh no, it turns out they actually really didn't. And, you know, look, we also have to know what great looks like, right? So replays IQ, instead of like having to use a CI tool where you go in and you use trackers, like to us, that's like horse and buggy. The Tesla is replays IQ where it auto snippets your great moments and it shows you exactly what great looks like. So 
I, I said I'd unpack two things. That's replays IQ versus humans. I think the, the first part of your question was, what just makes a human good coach? And like, how can we level up there? Is that, do you want me to kind of get into that a little bit? Or do you have any questions on the first part? No, I, 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 I love your answer on the first part. Dale must have told you that any Tesla reference makes me happy. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I love that. I think that everything you said is spot on, right? Like at the end of the day, um, what good looks like and getting as close to it as possible. There's so many reps who never, ever, ever get this. Um, and we talk a lot about AI. We do a lot with AI and where AI is going to help, where AI should help. Um, this is absolutely an example of AI done right um, versus some of the shit people are trying to use AI for. Um, so I digress. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, that is an interesting one, right? Like, um, I think it, we are seeing more really good use cases of AI SaaS products in production, but it's taken a while. There's been a lot of, yeah. um, there's, there's been a lot of fluff out there. And so, yeah, it is, it is important what, you know, tool you choose, but, but don't get me wrong. Like I play around with GPT as much as sure. anyone else and, and love, you know, but it's good for certain things and, and, and not great, great for others. Dave, you, you alluded to it earlier. You, you kind of dealt with a bit of a setback because you were kind of like, you grew almost too fast, too big. And then you had to like reevaluate everything. Talk to the uh, audience about that thought process, right? When you're like, I got to change this. How do I change it? Like, what was that mindset that you had? And what are the things that you're like, I'm just going to take the deep dive into changing this to a software company versus a services company? Because I think there are people listening to this that would be like, I don't even know, like, should I just make the jump? What are the things that they should be doing in these setbacks? Yeah, I definitely took a crawl, walk, run approach. Um, if you look at what we did for three and a half years and the outcome of that and and sort of the the product the customer sees, it's not that different than what we productized. So uh, there are some adjacencies that are different, but we basically, you can uh, think of the first three and a half years as market research for our product. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we built the, the, thankfully we have thousands of hours of labeled data because the call reviews were done asynchronously and recorded. So we've got this unique data set that Zoom, Gong, Clary, Outreach, you know, Zoom Info, they don't have. You can't just take a um, really, you can you can take, you can't take a, a $3 million a year AI person, and it's crazy to think they exist, but they do, um, and a great dev team and say, go solve this. You, you need two things that they don't have. That is subject matter experts, where we have a team of coaches, and you need a model that has very high quality data. And... Um, and I know we all know this, but the, the the thing for me is I'm like, okay, and this is before OpenAI came out with GVT and all that. We, we, we said, every customer said, why can't you, not every, a lot of customers said, why can't you package this into a product? And we started thinking, well, let, let's give that a try with a crawl, walk, run approach. And the crawl, walk, run was, all right, I'm not going to raise any money yet. I'm just going to have human score calls instead of review calls before that's a nuance that's important before we had our hundred replace best practices which were really important um you know aspects to follow in a disco call or demo and we'd have different ones for smb mid-market enterprise etc but we really needed to nail down what the right formula is from a rubric perspective. What's the mm -hmm. one, what's the two, what's the three, what's the four for all of these skills? What are the right skills for outbound generated versus inbound? And then we had to hire great humans to score those calls. And we, we paid a lot to do that in the early days um, because hiring folks like you two to do that, it doesn't come cheap. Um, but we did that and we had a part-time AI person take that data and make meaning from it to say, like, oh, wow, here are the patterns we're seeing. And it would start to spot patterns that the rest of us didn't see and that humans couldn't see. And so we would take that to, let's say, a senior leader at Vidyard and be like, who's been a customer for three years already, and be like, hey, would you pay for this? And like, yes, I'd pay for it. So it's like, boom. I remember I went to you know, one of our customers and we got a six-figure deal to just score calls and have AI do a little bit of Intel that was still way farther than what, let's say, 
your, your typical conversational intelligence tools do, um, but still nowhere close to what we do today. And so that was the first like, okay, someone's actually willing to pay six figures for this. Then we would get feedback after a few months. And they'd say, we like this, like this, we hate this, we hate this. And man, we learned a lot. Like we learned that we thought we would just score calls and they'd love it. They're like, no, we need you to spoon feed us the data to provide our reps because mm. that's what's really going to make our lives easier. And we're like, really? And then now I'm like, yeah, of course you do. I would need that too. It's and, like I, and I think, I think that's, that's the big learning that I, as you were talking, like, you have to, you think it's one thing, but now they are like, I need the spoon fed data. I don't want you to, I, I just don't want it to be presented. Like you got to give it to me in a digestible format. And I think too many times as technology companies out there, we just say, this is the right way to do it. And people just want to be spoon fed it. People buy from people. That's why companies who invest in meaningful connections win. The best part, gifting doesn't have to be expensive to drive results. Just thoughtful. Sendoso's intelligent gifting platform is designed to boost personalized engagement throughout the entire sales process. Trust me, I led sales for a Sendoso competitor, and I could tell you no one does gifting better than Sendoso. If you're looking for a proven way to win and retain more customers, visit Sendoso.com. Yeah, absolutely. Like there's no frictionless uh, experience out there that takes a sales call and tells you exactly what happened and what you should do better and then gives your sales rep the get well plan and replays IQ does that and it only does that because we had to go through the pain of what I'm describing and like so yeah we I think for the, the folks that are listening their founders that are, are thinking about maybe making the transition from services to tech or someone who's thinking about just starting their own gig uh, crawl, walk, run worked great for us before I got a single dollar uh, or requested a single dollar of someone to invest in us because we were bootstrapped to that point. I wanted some level of market validation, some mm -hmm. level of product market fit. I would never ask someone to do it. I would always, always, a tenant that we've always adhered to at Replays for the last five years is there's no way you have product, even early indicators of product market fit unless you're actually charging. So we had to charge a certain level, right? Anyone can say, here's a free thing. Do you like it? Yes, I do. Well, you can't say that's an early indicator of product market fit in my mm -hmm. opinion. And so we went from there to, okay, let's, let's ask some of our customers, some executive I've worked with people and partners, people like uh, Sam Jacobs at Pavilion. Pavilion was a, our, one of our very first investors, uh, Andrew Wilkinson at Tiny Capital. And we just put together 250 K safe and we're like, okay, now let's get a very MVP MVP. We did that. And uh, it started taking off and then we're like, okay, let's go do a venture round. We did that with Finance Ventures. We had 18 other angels come in, a lot of uh, awesome founders that I've worked with uh, and, and, and customers. And, um, and then we built the product and, you know, here we are a year and we, you know, three months later after that, that pre-seed round and uh, the product's live and we're out there selling our, our hearts out and really just doing the same thing we always did, which is trying to provide an immense amount of value back to our customers. The value part is huge, right? Like, and I think that when you talk about product market fit and providing value, like I believe you're right. I don't think that like, if you have a free product and people are using it and oh yeah, like it's great, it's free. Like, oh, I, I, I've achieved product. You haven't like people yeah. like it for free um whether they're willing to pay for it or not whether it's five dollars or you know five hundred dollars a month like are people willing to pay for this so i, I love yeah. that you've touched on that i don't think that that's something that we talk about enough when we're talking about that transition um to product market fit um there's lots of people who are willing to talk to dale for free when he wants to charge <laughs> them they just suddenly don't want to speak to I, I, I don't know um it's crazy to me um, but you know, you, you touched on this a little, Dave, and we talk a lot about balancing growth and sustainability. And when you're trying to get product market fit, when you're trying to get as many customers as you can, um, when you're trying to grow the numbers, a lot of times, um, there's this pursuit of like, just do it as fast as you can spend as much as you can hire as many people as you can just go, 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 go um and break shit while you do it versus what i think over the past 12 to 18 months has come into play which is more of a like yes we need to grow but we need to do it in a scalable sustainable and steady manner 
Um, and you've talked mm -hmm. a little bit, I think, about how you've done that. But like, what what's your thesis and thought process? Like, how do you balance as quickly as you probably want to grow um, versus how quickly you probably should grow um, and raising at the right time? And we were talking a little bit about this, you know, before uh, before we went live. Yeah. Well, first thing I'd say on that is get as much money as you can when you can. Mm. Okay. <laughs> Um, and I used to get all fussed about, no, like, I don't want too much dilution at this stage and we're going to be at X ARR in nine months and then I'll raise again and then we'll be, but what we've all learned over time is that the market runs in cycles and when it's hot, it's hot. When it's not, it's not. And, uh, so I think that would be step one is, uh, I'm not a technical founder, as you know, uh, my subject matter expertise and domain expertise is sales and sales leadership. And a technical founder, I remember saying to um, a person I used to work for who had just an amazingly successful business, um, at, uh, Dennis Pellerinos. So him and, and Chris Stott and another fellow started Buddy Build, which was acquired by Apple. And he, he said to me about a year ago, he's one of my mentors. And I'm like, I think we just need like 500K the next year. He's like, are you kidding me? He's like, you're building a tech company, man. Like... And, and I, I, I remember thinking, well, you know, that sounds high, but okay. And, and this came from me bootstrapping, right? So I had to kind of get in the mentality of this is my first time building a product. This is my first time raising for my own product. And what I've learned is um, get as much money as you can when you can. That's number one. And number two, I, I think your question of like, how do you not get ahead of your skis and, and do too much too quick? I think it all has to do with the customer. It really does. It has to do with what the customer is saying about your product. I a hundred percent think that um, people over, okay. We, we almost ran into this where we almost overbuilt too much mm -hmm. before mm -hmm. we released. Yep. We had great design partners. And I think that was one of the keys to our success as, success as well as I, I did reach out to folks like Kyle Norton and Mark Cosaglo a year and a half ago and said, Will you be a paid design partner knowing that if this does, if this is a product that they want to rave about, there'll be people who will listen <laughs> and lots of people who will listen. And thankfully that worked out. So I think that would be one thing. But in terms of, uh, I think it's like when you do a raise, you need to say to yourself, is it for 18 months? Is it for 12 months? Probably 18 months minimum. If so, are there any revenue projections in there? And if so, are those even close to realistic? And then it's like, okay, well then I need to hire to that. And like literally every single day, look at how you're doing relative to burn um, and don't over hire. So I guess that, I know that all sounds logical, but sometimes the logic goes up. It, 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 it does, but it doesn't though. There, there's so many people that we talk to that it's logical, but it's just not reality. And I think this is where a lot of founders in my mind really need to take a moment step back, listen, re re rewind and re-listen. You got to focus on the logic. You have to focus. Dale talks about it all the time. You got to focus on the foundation and the fundamentals because when you start skipping around um, and you start throwing logic out the window, it, it doesn't usually end well. Yeah. And I'll, I'll share an honest, like kind of transparent uh, moment that doesn't make my decision making look amazing, but whatever. If it's the spirit of learning, like when we did our raise last March, so a year ago, uh, we just raised a million bucks and it was to get our real MVP off the ground. And I did think if we build it, they will come. I don't mean the customers. I meant because the, the customers are, uh, thankfully, that's all panning out. But I meant our next round. I thought, ah, we build this thing that's just going to absolutely crush what Gong and Chorus and Zoom and everyone can do. And we're definitely going to have an amazing raise. I mean, we even, because we've got such a defensible, unique moat and data set uh, that we've been able to label, we've got um, a, a worldwide patent that we, mm -hmm. you know, pending that we've filed and, and that kind of thing. And I thought, okay, surely uh, that will be enough to raise money. Uh, and in Q4 this past year, and it wasn't, you know, the, the, the bar has been raised significantly in this downturn. We all know that. And um, it left me in a scenario where 
Um, I had definitely, I, I'd already parted ways with the services business. We wound it down and, you know, finished off our contracts with our final customers there. And I didn't hedge by keeping that alive for a little bit while we were doing, building the product. And I just relied on the fact that we'd be able to raise a whole bunch of money in Q4 and we didn't. So we had to, you know, irresponsible. It was, you know, um, sorry, I won't, it was in hindsight, um, I wouldn't have made the exact same decision, but you also have to swing for the fences sometimes. And um, I, in this market where AI, it seems like our knowledge is doubling every like three weeks, uh, which I know it's not, but you know, I, I just refuse to just do this half-ass. I refuse to have a pretty good services business and a pretty good product that took me two extra freaking years to roll out. I was like, no, we're doing this. And if we, worst case scenario, we do what we've always done, which is rely on our team sales ability to go out and sell. And so, yeah, we, Q4, we were running out of money. Uh, we were, we had a great product that was just launching, but we couldn't have sold it until then. And we put a real squeeze on ourselves that was like, I can't just, I just can't even begin to tell you how much stress there was for our team. Uh, we had to unfortunately part ways with a couple of great people. Mm. Uh, and we've retrenched now and got some, um, you know, government funding in place, which is great. We've got the ARR starting to pump through and some happy customers. Uh, and so revenue now is taking care of our expenses uh, or will in the next few months anyway, uh, until we do that next raise. But yeah, uh, so there's the honest story of, that's why I say get as much money as you can, because I could have actually gotten an extra million bucks a year ago and I didn't. Yeah, and, and things change as you go through that process. So it's a super tricky, like you feel like, oh, money's flowing, it's going to be great. And then it goes sideways. And it, yeah. that's, a, that's a great piece of advice. And I think... Um, not enough people think about it because they're always thinking about the equity as well. Like you're giving up more equity. There's a, yeah. there's a lot of different pieces you got you to balance. So, well, in the spirit of giving, we really appreciate you being transparent. Um, we yeah. believe in giving more than receiving and you've been grateful to give out to the audience. So uh, tell them what you're going to give them. Yeah, absolutely. So for five revenue leaders out there who um, are interested in having I now we're on consult with myself and or our head of data insights, Kaylin Pino. Mm. We would love to do that. Uh, it's not a sales call. It'd be a true consult on helping to um, share what we've learned to uh, create a sales coaching culture. And um, we'll also do, we'll also commit to a call review for them as, uh, as well, just to kind of show them the framework that we use. Awesome. That's amazing. Dale. Consulting calls don't have to be sales calls. <laughs> Learn from Dave, Dale. <laughs> That's who? Dale gets someone on the phone and before he's done, he's like, all right, so you want to send a contract? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> um, I love it. To totally kidding. Um, Dave, talk to me a little bit. You know, when you look at Replays IQ over the next five years, where, where, where do you guys plan on going? And more importantly, like the landscape continues to change, right? Both the financial landscape and the AI landscape. How's that going to impact the journey? The landscape is changing a lot every day, uh, but the needs out there don't change. And I think what we're, we've been super hyper-focused on solving very specific problems for very specific use cases. B2B SaaS sellers, SDRs, AEs, and then SMB mid-market enterprise. And we haven't ventured outside of that, uh, save a little bit of customer success. But, um, and so our, our, uh, when you look at the needs five years ago and their needs now, it's the same, right? Sales reps need coaching. Sales leaders don't have time to coach. Um, but we have a massive vision. And in five years, there are two things that Replays plans to do. One is, yeah, everyone's trying to get uh, AI bots to join sales calls. Uh, we see it a lot in customer uh, service right now. Um, and our goal is not to replace sales reps, right? Like there'll always be a role for sales reps at a certain level. But I do think that we are very well positioned to be the mm. company that has the first B2B solutions consultant where that joins your call. So like, 
how many times have you seen a scenario where there's 30 sales reps supported by one solutions consultant and like how many deals could have been converted had there been the right level of product knowledge on that call? And let's face it, I see in the future, and who knows if I'm right or wrong, I see sales moving up market. I see robots doing SMB emerging calls in three years. I just do. And I and so when I say I don't see um, tech replacing sales, what I, I think sales will just become higher order, uh, or, uh, higher order discipline. And I think that, I think that, ro- I think that the ability to have a, an actual bot jump in and conduct a 30 minute disco demo where it's a phased approach, the prospect has a choice. I'll either can get a disco demo by a human or a robot. Um, like if you look at what date we've learned, what data sets needed to do that correctly. And we've got that. So that's number one. Uh, and then number two is we've learned now how to fine tune models to understand and evaluate what's happening in a conversation, not just a sales conversation. And you look at all of you look at industry, whether you're sitting on, on hold waiting to talk to a banking representative or someone at your telco, your cell phone, you know, you're looking to upgrade your cell phone, uh, cell phone or get a different plan. Uh, all of those calls need to be evaluated yep. and they're evaluated by humans. Our machines are going to do all of that. So mm-hmm. we're going to expand. We've been hyper-focused to really learn this one space, this one discipline, this one industry. We're going to be going out and applying this to all conversations everywhere. Um, and and so, yeah, two big lofty visions, but 100% attainable. I love it. Thank you very much. Dale, let's wrap up with some uh, some rapid fire questions. Just one or two answers, uh, one or two word answers, and let's get it started. If you weren't in tech, what other profession would you be in? If I oh sorry, if I wasn't in tech, what other profession would I be in? Um, I think maybe I'd love to say professional golfer, but I, I'm, a, I'm an 18 handicap, so I'm still going to go with professional golfer. Let's pretend I had the actual ability to do it. I love it. I, I'm right with you with the 18 handicap. So. I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not a golfer. Uh, what's the one thing you do to unwind after a long, stressful day? Run. Cool. Run, Forest. Awesome. What's the first app you check when you wake up? Oh, my, my Garmin sleep app. Nice. Yeah. We have not got that answer before. Um, yeah. I oh, like really? it. No, normally it's either Slack or LinkedIn. Um, so it's nice to hear something different. <laughs> or email. Or email. Yeah. Dave, what's uh, what's your favorite guilty pleasure snack? When you're done with a run and you're oh. like, F it, what are, what are we, what are we diving <laughs> yeah. into? Yeah, two things. Uh, I enjoy chips, so I'll have like uh, dill pickle chips or uh, I'll have like a, re- a rebel, like a fudgicle. You know, <laughs> love those. Nice. Last one. Dream vacation destination. Maui. Nice. Have you been? Maui. Uh, yeah, it's one of our favorite That's places awesome. to go, but it's still uh, still my dream. Yeah. Like if I could choose one place to be, it'd probably be that. I love it. Very cool. Dave, thank you so much. Thanks for joining us. Where uh, where can people find you and where can people learn about, more about Replays IQ? Yeah, so replaysiq.com. Feel free to check out the videos we have on there. And uh, please hit me up on LinkedIn. I'd love to hear from you if you have any questions uh, at all on things we didn't cover today. And even email me, Dave at replays.com, R-E-P-L-A-Y-Z. Awesome. Thanks, Dave. Dave. Thanks for joining appreciate us, man. Appreciate you. you. Thank Thanks, you. Thanks, guys. I really enjoyed the convo. Really appreciate it. Have you a too. great day.